so yeah, this is this is long overdue, Monta. We've been talking on here for years, you know. We've had a lot of colourful discussions, quite a lot of, you know, um, we've had quite a lot of, I don't know about arguments, but we've had lots of differences of opinion over the years. But the, the thing I do respect about you is you never pull rank and say, listen, I did this and I did that and you never even turn pro. You never, you never come the big I am with these arguments. You just, you go blow for blow, you know. No, I, I just, I just like, I just want people to know, or, you know, let people know, I, I don't take none of this stuff serious, yeah. so. I don't mean you gotta get upset. I mean, I like I like to debate. I don't like to argue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? I just want to debate. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So listen, you had the most enviable start in life when it comes to boxing because you were in this incredibly privileged position to spend an awful lot of time when you were a child around the incomparable Muhammad Ali. Tell us about that and how it came about. You've got videos of yourself with Ali. You've got pictures when you were kiddies. You know, how did it all come about? My, my brother, I mean, my father um, took my, my brother, Tim, uh, Tim at the time, uh, to, uh, to, to learn self-defense. And uh, he fell in love with, he got real cool with Johnny Coulon, who was the Bantamweight champion from Canada. Yeah. But he, you know, lived in Chicago, had a John, Johnny Coulon gym. And uh, he fell in love with it, and uh, he bought the gym. So this is 1973, so I'm three years old. So I'm just going to the gym every day. I, I thought it was just a regular life. I didn't know I was doing nothing different than anybody yeah, yeah, else. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, I was watching, you know, I, you saw the videos I've been posting. Yeah. Uh, my, my father had a nine millimeter camera. He would, you know, take movies, everything. And uh, he showed me Ray Robinson, Joe Lewis, Willie Pep, uh, what's the kid? Uh, the guy who, fought, who beat Joe Lewis and got robbed. Uh, just Jersey Joe Walcott. Yeah, I just saw all of that, and I just tend, for some reason, I I lean towards the slicker fighters. Yeah. So, you know, he showed me a video of Muhammad uh, Cassius Clay at the time, and, and it just blew my mind. I just, it just took my attention. Watching him took my attention away from everybody else, and that's all I, I worried about. That's all I wanted to see, and uh, one day he told me, he said, uh, Remember that guy you watched on video? He said, we're going to see him. Huh. And, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm five years old. I, I'm not going to call my father a liar. Hmm. Or, you know, I, I just, I, I just, I'm, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I didn't know. I didn't think I was going to see Muhammad Ali. And uh, I remember he had a garage on 47th where he kept all his cars, but he had a ring. He had a ring there. And I walked in and I, you know, we walked into his office and, and I turned and I looked. I said, man, that's Muhammad Ali. You know, I'm like, that's Muhammad Ali. And he looked at me and gave me a, like, you know, wink, you know, like, you know, just wait for a little while. I'm like, all right. And, you know, while I'm standing there, like I said, I'm five years old. It's a line of people. You know, it's a line of people coming up to him. And he, he just he take our money and he just give it to, you know, one by one, one by one, one by one. Give him the money, give him the money. And I just, just blew my mind. Yeah. And um, when he was done, he looked at me and said, come here. He picked me up, put me in a lap. He gave me a kiss on my cheek. And uh, I remember my father took a picture. And that was, that was the first picture I took with him at five years old. And um, after that, it was just from, from, from five years old to going on 13, I saw him on a regular basis. If, whenever he was in town, he was just, you know, he asked my father, uh, can I come train? I'm, or I'm you know, No, he, he wouldn't ask him. He would just tell him what day he was coming. Yeah. Because, at, at, you know, after he was at the gym for five minutes, the whole city would know. Yeah. And, you know, so it was just, you know, it was like a, a circus every day. But uh, it was just, you know, it was a great experience. And um, and, and I remember this like yesterday. As soon as he finished training, he would walk up to my father and say, Griff, you know, what you doing today? He'd be like, no. He said, come by the house. And we'd just go to the house. You know, he lived like 10 minutes from the gym. So we'd go to the house and have a park and just hang out. And um, like I said, that was just a regular thing for uh, eight years of my life. And so, did you know, for, as, even as a child then, did you know that that was the life you wanted to live? You were going to be a professional fighter? No way about it. I mean, you know, that's all I knew. You know what I'm saying? That's, I was in the gym at one years old. I mean, I trained every day. Uh, my brother was 10 years older than me. He would beat me up every day. Yeah. Uh, one time, my mother whipped me, and my brother told me, if you ever cry when she whip you, I'm going to beat your ass worse. <laughs> When she, when she done. So that's what I was that's what I was dealing with. So, you know, I just had, you know, so much toughness built up inside of me because of my brother and my uh, my first farm partner, his name was Tony Roberts. He was like 
five, six years older than me, but he was smaller. And, you know, he, you know, we were sparring. You know, my, you know, my father, you know, tell him, let him tee off on me and everything. And he was like, man, you was punching hard. You know what I'm saying? And every, but this, this, this true story. Every time the phone rang, I would get, I would get uh, scared because my father would leave to go answer the phone, and then my sparring partner would beat me yeah. up. So when, yeah, whenever the phone rang, I said, "Oh my God!" So, but you know, I never told my father nothing. But you know, that just made me. I guess it just made me tougher. But that was just, you know, that was just uh, some great experiences in my life. You know, what I'm saying I, I went to Deer Lake at seven years old. Uh, I watched Muhammad Ali spar Larry Holmes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Larry Holmes came back to the dressing room, and and I thought, you know, at seven years old, I thought he was being disrespectful. He said, "I'm gonna be the man one day. This is all gonna be mine." And yeah. and, and and crazy about it, uh, I was in camp with Riddick Bo. We was in New Orleans, and Larry Holmes was fighting in Saint, in, um, in Mississippi. And I told Bo, "Let's go to the fight." And we drove there, and I went to Larry Holmes' dressing room and told him the story. I said, "Now nah, I understand what you meant by that." Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because he ended up being one of the greatest fighters in history. I believe so. I mean, some people, some people are high on Larry, and other people not so high. I mean, some people say he's the most underrated champion of all time. I don't, I don't agree with that because I think he is rated by people like yourself and me. And I think lots of people know how good he was. I think he would have took some beating head to head, really. Um, I mean, I, th I put him like just behind Ali, really, in that pecking order. When you talk about who would have beaten who. You could say Joe Lewis was a greater champion, maybe, because of certain things he did. But I think Larry would have beat him, for instance. Uh, I mean, you, I, like, Joe, Joe Lewis is in my top five mm -hmm. of all time. But I think all my other folk could beat him because he was too small. I, he was a little small. I mean, he was, he was deep, yeah, yeah. and he was, he was perfect in so many ways. I mean, he, right. he was ahead of his time, I do believe, you know, in terms of you look at the, the, the way he executed. You know, um, you you know what? Not to cut you off, but the thing that impressed me more than anything with Joe Lewis, him having the longest reign in history, was him getting knocked out by Max Smelling yeah. before he became champ, mm -hmm. and he still became champ and became how great he was. Yeah, and it wasn't easy for Joe because he had to he had to tread a very careful path in those days. Right, in terms right, of right. Racial he, stuff. right. But anyway, let's talk, not talk right. about Joe Lewis. Let's talk about you. So, um. I believe you had around 40 amateur fights, 41, something like that. I, I had, I fought, what well, you know, in amateur boxing back then, you, the fights didn't count until you was 10, 10 years old. I actually went to the uh, Ohio, uh, Ohio uh, State yeah, Fair yeah. at nine and fought until 11 years old. I made it to the semifinals. I had a few fights, you know what I'm saying? But not- Smokers. I couldn't really- fight. Smokers. They call them smokers. Yeah, I had a few fights. I had a few fights, but like I said, I, I quit at 13, 12, 13, and I came back at 21, and I had 30 amateur fights to make the Olympic team. Yeah, and you you lost to Jeremy Williams, and then you beat him twice in a box-off, right? I mean, Jeremy, my man, I just did his show the other week. He said everything is cool. We He put the pads behind us, but I beat Jeremy every time. Every time, time we yeah. We fought, fought. I beat him. I'm, every fight was the exact same way. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, people say, like, I, 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 I you know, Jeremy had, like, over 100 knockouts. And I, was, I fought 12 rounds with Jeremy Williams. He knocked out everybody. And people asked me, could he punch? I said, I don't know. I don't even... He never caught me with a clean punch in four fights. Yeah. So I fought, you know what I'm saying? I fought 12 rounds with Jeremy Williams, and he never caught me clean. All, all four of the fights was the same way. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but it, it is what it is, you know? So you went to Barcelona with the, the U.S. Olympic team. You won two yeah. fights. You, you won your first two fights, and then you lost in the third series, controversially, to a German called Torsten May. And I, 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 I'll be honest, I haven't seen the fight, but I did believe there was a controversy surrounding the fact that some of your points were given to him. Accredited. Well, well the, the whole thing, which was crazy, was they changed the bracket. Like, if you, if you listen to my second fight, my second fight is on YouTube. If you listen to my second fight, they saying how the Cuban team was recording my fight because I was supposed to fight the Cuban next. Yeah. They changed the bracket and put me in with Torsten Mai. Okay. Yeah. He, he's a softball, six foot five, I'm five seven. He threw a jab and I went over the top and, 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 and I just saw all the blood gush out his eye. And then I said, I won, it's over. You know what I'm saying? I like, as soon as I seen the blood, I said, I got a medal. That was the medal round. I was guaranteed a medal. And, um, 
when they checked his eye and uh, they didn't stop the fight and said box i said man you gotta be joking so come to find out the punch i hit him with they gave it to him they gave him the point yeah and then with 46 seconds ago they took three points from me because they said my head was low yeah. but i'm five seven he's six five so they, they, they just robbed me of my olympic dream i mean they uh i watched the 1976 olympics with my father and i saw ray Leonard win the gold medal and i just wanted to do i just wanted to do it just because i saw it with my father and when i'm being you know when i'm passing away i just man if i win this gold medal for my father it's just gonna show all the respect in the world and um you know they they took the, the you can't even find the fight nowhere yeah. they they hid the fight the germans uh they let the man fight with a patch over his eye what what amateur box do you know goes on after somebody is bleeding or cut yeah i never seen it. i got stopped myself one time on a cut even though i thought it was the man was bleeding like a pig. I couldn't see because so much blood was going in my eye, but it is what it is. Like I said, it, to this day, it bothers me. I mean, it's no, I'm supposed to have a medal, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I, beat, I beat the silver medalist a month before the Olympics. So I beat the gold medalist and silver medalist, and I don't have a medal. So, you know what I'm saying? It just, uh, it, it, it kills me. Yeah. So did, when, you, when you turned pro, did you work with Eddie Futch from the outset, or did you uh, go to... When I first turned pro, I was working with Didi Armour. Yeah. He trained Alfonso Ratliff. He's a world champion. Yeah, yeah. He was a world champion yeah. in Chicago. Didi Armour was my trainer. Uh, Eddie Davis and my brother. Um, Didi just was like, man, I, you know, I'm getting old. I can't do the traveling and everything. So so I ended up getting an older coach. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, we ended up, you know what I'm saying. So uh, I was sitting in Chicago one day, and my manager called me. He said, pack up. We're going to D.C. So you got, you know, we we gonna uh, we gonna. You, I need you got a trial for Eddie Fuchs. Yeah. I said Eddie Fuchs. I said Eddie Futch. Yeah. He like, yeah, yeah. So we packed up and moved. And um, as soon as I walked in the gym, Eddie Futch walked up to me and said, "I heard you want me to train you. You got to spot Mike McCallum first, okay. and then that's how I'm gonna make up my mind." And that I, I took that as disrespect. I I took that as like disrespectful, like 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 I can't, you know, what I'm saying. That's how I took it. Yeah. And, you know, I went in and you know I did my thing, and when, as soon as I walked out the ring, he came and shook my hand and said, "Welcome to the team." So <laughs> I, that I, you know, what I'm saying? I used that for motivation, and, it, and you know, it worked out for me. I mean, how, quite how good did you think Mike McCallum was? People say. I mean, you know, I, the first time I spotted Mike McCallum, he threw a sweeping left hook, and and the thought of Don Curry came in the back of my mind, and I said, "Put your right hand up and step yeah. back, so you won't get hit." You know what I'm saying? So I, you know, Mike McCallum was a. Uh, was a was a legend to me, you know what I'm saying? But for some reason, I think because I was in the gym so young, I was I was too dumb to be intimidated by fighters yeah, yeah. or be nervous or whatever. So, you know what I'm saying? I, I boxed circles around Mike McCallum. I mean, we sparred about four or five times, and if you talk to anybody who watched us spar, it was I played with him. Yeah. And Eddie, Eddie first stopped letting me spar with him. Yeah, it's interesting what happens in a gym sometimes. Um, so your, your first major kind of calling card victory was what some people call a controversial decision, majority decision over James Tony um, in Las Vegas. Uh, tell me about that. Well, I I got I got to I got to get credit to Ray Lathan. Um, I fought Ray Lathan before James, yeah. and I think Ray Lathan got me ready for that fight because the first time I got hurt, I got dropped. Uh, he was a, the hardest punch that ever hit me in my life. Yeah. And um, that's the fight that got me ready. So I got a phone call from my manager. He said, uh, he said, man, HBO called and said, do you want to fight James Tony?" I said, what they offering? He said, 60000 I said, man, I said, look, tell him to give me 100000 and I'll take it. Yeah. He called me back 10 minutes later and said, the fight is on. So, I mean, I just, the way I looked at it, James Tony was my idol. He was my favorite fighter. Yeah. Like, I stayed in the James Tony house. James Tony was going to be my manager. But uh, things didn't work out, and I came back home. And I just told myself, I said, look, I said, that was uh, three years ago. I know I got better. You know, I was an amateur at the time. And it was tit for tat, you know what I'm saying? Uh, James, he actually told me, he said, man, it's like I'm, I'm sparring a, a mirror of myself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was tit for tat. So I said, man, if James couldn't do nothing to me as an amateur, three years later, I, said, I know I'm better. I'm, you know, I'm better enough. I mean, I'm, I'm better now. Yeah. And, um, you know, only had 14 pro fights, but... Uh, you know, I, I felt I was ready, and and like, uh, and just to say this now, the crazy thing about it, because I don't get no credit for nothing in boxing. Yeah, 
Um, I took I took off eight years from I this why I told I told Roy Jones when Roy Jones I found out Roy Jones fought Teron Millett, my 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 USA teammate. I said, man, I said that's crazy. I said I should have been fighting with y'all. He said, yeah, your mom, your mom, your mom made you. I said, yeah. I said I lost out eight years. I like I'd have been a star in, the, in amateur boxing where people you know was got behind me. You know what I'm saying? So I just told him I said, bro, I said I had my first fight January 1991. I, in 30 fights I made the Olympic team. Yeah. I turned pro. I fought James Tony with 14 pro fights, and all this happened in four years. Yeah. So I ain't fight for eight years, and in four years I made the limit team and beat James Tony. I mean, yeah. What what, what I, can you say? I mean, and I'm aware that you feel you haven't got the credit. You're not one of the. You don't get your just due from what you achieve because I remember it was quite funny one time. I did a top 10 greatest defensive fighters of all time, in my opinion, and broke it down. And you said, "What? There's no no Montel Griffin on here," and you mentioned another fighter too. And I said, do you honestly think you belong in this company, uh, Montel? And you said, well, I'm 2-0 and against one of the guys on your list. And I had to be like, you know what? That's a good point. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else to say. I mean, okay. Like, I had a friend of mine. We, we was out one day, and um, yeah, we were talking about boxing. And, and some people were saying, uh, saying the same thing. Like, man, you don't get no credit for nothing. And my friend said, said he said, man, the man beat the man who knocked out Evander Holyfield twice. Yeah. He said, "You should. It, it should be none else said. I beat the man who beat Ho Evander Holyfield. You know, I beat him twice. You know what I'm saying? And people, people keep saying about controversy. I, 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 this is the part I don't understand. Okay, I fought Jane Tony twice. Yes. Right? Okay. Six different judges. Not one judge ever voted for James Tony. Yeah. And the the first fight was um, uh, what you call majority. it? It wasn't unanimous. It was, it was majority. Right, one one judge called it a draw, mm -hmm. but I, I actually knocked James Tony down. They didn't give me credit for it. I hit James Tony and he fell into the ropes, just like Roy did. Yeah. But Roy got credit for knockdown. I did. So if I were to get that knockdown, it'd have been unanimous decision yeah. both fights. So I don't understand uh, how is it. Uh, not one judge ever voted for James Tony. That's uh, one thing, regardless of your. Um evaluation and the credit you do or don't get one thing you will always be um immortalized as is the first man to beat roy jones as a professional i mean a lot of people don't give me credit for that a lot of people say i didn't beat roy jones boxing news i saw i saw the report in boxing news before i watched the fight and it said although uh the ending was a controversial disqualification it said montel griffin was giving roy jones all the trouble he could handle up until then without a doubt he was frustrated yeah you know what i'm saying and and just like I tell everybody, I told Roy, I said, Roy, I said, your fans love you so much that they hate me because you hit me. <laughs> and, and, and that's the truth. They, they hate, yeah, they, they love him so much. His fans love him so much that they hate me because he hit me when I was on my knee. And that's crazy. I mean, how good do you feel he was? Some people will say Roy was Superman at that point. No one was beating Roy Jones. In terms of a bit. But, Never mind in terms of resume, but just in terms of his sheer physical capabilities and his right. Well, at, at that time they were saying some people say that I don't say it. What, what's right. Well, at that time they were saying he was the best pound for pound fighter in history. They, they were. Um, it, it was getting to that point. He, you know, saying he really kept winning. Uh, I, I just, he was the fastest man I've ever been with, and you know, he's the fastest man I've been ring yeah. with. I sparred bantamweights to heavyweights. Uh, I sparred Floyd Mayweather. It, it, the speed level is just is not is is not comparable. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, you spar Roy Jones. Just, you spar with Floyd Mayweather. I fl I sparred Floyd Mayweather. The whole gym stopped. It was a defensive battle. Yeah. Uh, no, you know, what I'm saying nobody landed shots. We just just you know made each other you know miss and everything. And you know, I, you know, I I've been with, I've been in the ring with the greatest fighters in the world, and I held my own with all of them. Yeah, but, but the only the only the only guy I never sparred who I was in the gym with was Virgil Hill. Uh, Eddie Fush would never let us spar. Yeah. Um, I sparred everybody: Mike McCallum, uh, Samuel Peter, Hasim Rockman. Uh, yeah, every, I mean I sparred everybody, and, and I did my thing with everybody. You know what I'm saying? I just feel you know what I'm saying. I just feel like I never, I just never got the credit I deserve. Okay, well obviously one thing which probably doesn't help. Um, in that regard, is the rematch. Um, we know what happened. You know, right, what, what right, happened right. For that's another thing. That's another thing. Now, look, okay, it, it bothered me then. 
it don't even bother me now. I, I was I, I didn't warm up five minutes for that fight. Uh, I, I'm gonna tell you a true story, you know, and because, and uh, you know, I have a book out where it's, you know the stories in the book. Yeah. Uh, um, when I when I lost to Roy Jones, uh, the next day Chris Bird called me and said, "Man, I ain't gonna say his name. I ain't gonna say nobody now." He just said, "Man, Roy God told me what they did to you." He said, "That's a damn shame." 20, it took me 20 years before I saw him again. I asked him, I said, uh, what did you tell Chris? He said, we got, he said, we fucked you. He said, we did it on purpose. He said, we rushed you in the ring. We wanted you to lose. We, we did it. He said, your manager promoter knew about it. And that, that broke my heart. You know what I'm saying? Well, I, I asked funny. my manager about it. Of course he denied it. Huh? He called you to the ring early. Yeah, I mean, if, if you, if it's guys, it was people who was at the fight, who, who I got witnesses. Uh, Elvis Grant Phillips was there. You can ask him. Uh, they rushed me in. I, I didn't get a chance to warm up. I was a, I was a world champion, mm -hmm. and you know what I'm saying. I couldn't get warmed up. So I look at it now. That just lets you know how good I was. That they didn't want to, they didn't want to face me at 100. percent And I just leave it at that. Yeah. I do, um, after that, that phase af afterwards in your career, I think some people might not even realize that you actually boxed on until 2011, and had a couple challenges yeah. against elite fighters. Um, Darius Mikulczewski being one of them in Germany, which another 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 robbery. Another I got stabbed in the back. I'm in Germany. I'm winning every round on every score card. The man come throw some punches after the bell. Joe Cortez stopped the fight. Yeah. I said, what are you doing, man? Oh, you were taking too much punch. I said, what what the hell you think I was doing to him? I went in every round on every score card. You know what I'm saying? It was it's just crazy, man, how much dirt is in this boxing game, man. And, and I, you know what I'm saying, I, and, I, and, I, and I suffer from it so many times. Yeah. Um, and Roy never wanted to fight Mikulczewski, right? I mean, he... When I, when I got back from Germany, I saw Roy at the, at the, at the Thomas and Mack. I think we was at a... Uh, there was a fight. We was at Thomas and Mack. He said, man... Him and James Tone. James Tone's like, man, I'm sorry about what happened, man. I saw the fight. And Roy was like, man... He said, that's why I ain't going yeah. over there. He said, he said, I saw what happened to you. Like, that's a damn shame. He said, I ain't going over there. So, I, just, I mean, you know, I, I just been one of them guys, man. Just, it is what it is. I just had to, you know, do what I, you know, went through. You, um, after that, your your next major uh, title challenge against a league fighter was in 2003 versus Antonio Tarver for the vacant WBC and IBF belts. Um, I, I've never seen that fight, to be honest. It's someone I'm going to catch up with and watch at some point. Right. I, w I was knocked out in the first round. He hit me in the back of the head in the first round. I had a concussion. I was knocked out, uh, and I still won 11 rounds. Yeah. So I'm happy. I'm proud of myself. Uh, I went home. I was in the I was in the bathroom in my house, laying on the floor uh, with my penis in my hand. Yeah. I'm laying on the floor. I had passed out. My wife woke me up. I said, "What is wrong with you?" We go to the hospital. I had a concussion. So I had a concussion in the first round. I still won 11 rounds. So. I'm, I'm, I, that just show you how tough I am. Sure. It was, uh, was it, when you finally called it a day, was it, was it a hard adjustment to make? Like so many fighters say that their life seems to lack meaning and the definition of who they are has gone out the window? Or did you make? Well, in, in, my, in my situation, in my situation, I ended up, uh, right at the end of my career, I, start, I got a job trying to, you know, uh, you know, change over and be able to, try to, you know, live a normal life and everything. So I became a, a, a Cook County Sheriff in Chicago. Okay. So my last fight, I was a Cook County Sheriff. So it was easy for me to kind of, you know, switch over. But as far as missing boxing, it, it, it bothered. I, I never, I never, uh, I never retired. Um, I, I just, I never, I was 41. I felt good. My last fight, I felt good. I wanted to continue, but uh, I just never got no great, no good, good enough offers. So. I never retired. I just never fought again. Just stopped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. What do you What do you have to? I mean, to, to these days, you just strictly make a living from from the sport, from the gym. Well, Coach. you know, I um because of boxing, you know, what I'm saying, I, you know, I was I was blessed and um try to be smart. So you know, I my own, my own boxing gym. I have a barber shop. Um, I have rental properties and everything. So I'm doing pretty good. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I uh my friends all call me. The cheapest man. They was like, "You're the cheapest man I ever seen in my life." So, I'm, I'm like, "I'm not spending a dime." Yeah. So. <laughs> Which so, I mean, the, the other thing is being in a good position financially today, which is obviously some a lot of fighters 
uh, don't have that same kind of good fortune for, for various reasons. But the other thing that's obvious to me from speaking to you face to face properly this time is that you're um, sharp mentally, cerebrally, you're still completely unimpaired, which once again, not every fighter is that fortunate either. Do you think it's a defensive thing because you ring smart? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It's all about defense. Like, you know, my whole career, I told people it's life at the boxing. Like, it was days, it was days where I got hit clean and sparring in the gym and it would bother me two or three days. That's how much yeah. I didn't want to get hit because I didn't want, you know, I had you know, a lot of friends, you know what I'm saying, that I know that boxing, you know, took a toll on them and, you know, they're not talking well and everything yeah. and, you know, it's doing bad and everything. So I just try to be as defensive as possible. And just like, well, my, well, my idol, Muhammad Ali, like I saw him over the years. I saw his voice, you know, slowing down, you know, and I could tell he wasn't the same. And yeah, like, like my father took me, he was at a Providence Hospital uh, on the low end of Chicago when he first got diagnosed with uh, Parkinson's. Yeah. And I remember my father saying, well, Muhammad, I said, where are we going? He said, well, Muhammad is sick. Let's go see him. So I'm looking, I'm like, he look, he look all right to me. But now, you know, as, as the years went on, I could, I could tell that his voice and everything slowed down and everything. So, uh, yeah, I just, man, I, you know, I, I hated getting hit. Man. I, I wanted to be, like me and Chris Bird was like uh, rivals as far as defense. We would just, you know, talk about it and, compare and i'm like man i ain't trying to get hit by nobody yeah i think a lot of damage gets done in the gym as well because maybe it's not just yeah what yeah, you have yeah. your brain doesn't know the difference whether you got paid for it or not to get hit in the head and you know ali, right. ali did a hell of a lot of hard sparring over many many years as well as starting at 12 and stopping at 40 and fighting uh, everybody who's who are two generations of heavyweights and thing with ali he was a genius of course he was and he was absolutely you know he, he was perfection when he was on side well, but he still took a lot of shots in the 70s. He did take a lot well, of shots. Well, the good thing about Ali was his chin, right? Yes. The what? bad thing about was Ali his was his chin. Yeah. He knew he could take punches. So he, Muhammad Ali thought that going to the gym training, guys hitting on him was going to get him prepared <laughs> for fights. So I would see him in the gym. He would just let his, his, his spawn partners beat him up. Yeah. He felt that that was this way of being able to take a fight. I mean, take a punch in a fight. And, uh, of course, you know, it, it wasn't. So, you know, it's sad. But, you know, he told me um, in 93, I had fought in Louisville. And his mother had a stroke. He was in town. And we told they told us him, Leon Spinks was with me. He flew out with my manager. So we called mm -hmm. Ali and he uh, invited over to his house. And we sat there and talked to him. And he was like, man, he's like, man. He said, I just want people to know I'm not brain damaged. He said, I'm just, I'm just trapped in my body. I just, I just don't have just... control of my body. He said, and he said, he said, I, 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 I would, I would do the same thing all over again. I don't want nobody feeling sorry for me. And it was crazy because, you know, this, this guy, Muhammad Ali, uh, the greatest guy we've ever seen. And he telling the story and it was a sad story. And, uh, and my lawyer, my manager told him, man, man, you are, you're a great public figure. And, you know, like I said, it was, a, it was like a serious point at that time. And, he, and Ali said, I'm a public nigga. And my lawyer, no, 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 I didn't say that. And Ali started laughing, like, nah, I'm just playing. But that, that was awesome, man, how he just broke up the, uh, broke the ice in the room. I remember it was quite a few years ago, but one time on Facebook I said that I believe that Sugar Ray Leonard, in pure technical terms, was an even better fighter. I mean, I love them both to death. And I said he was a more complete fighter. And you said... Ben Doughty, don't talk about my idol like that, or I'm gonna have someone come to London and kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think uh, if you if you look at Cassius Clay and what I'm saying, I don't mean no disrespect by not calling Muhammad Ali. I'm just saying when he was Cassius Clay, I don't think he, I don't think no I don't see I don't see nobody uh, the cat the, the fighter that beat Sonny Liston and Cleveland Williams. I don't see no headway in the world. True, but he, he, he's the greatest. But Muhammad Ali uh, beat Cleveland Williams. Catch his oh yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yes, yeah, that's when that's right when he changed over. So, dumb, dumb, dumb fighters. Right? I don't see nobody, nobody better. I don't think Ray Leonard's defense was good at all. Uh, uh, Ali's. That's an interesting. That's an interesting thing. I'm. I think. I think. I think Ray. You know, Ray's Ray's defense was his offense. Maybe he was, but but Ali wasn't the kind of guy who's going to defend in a pocket. Like a guy like Tim Witherspoon got a great defense, right? When he's just standing in front. Of him. 
yeah. right? Because of that thing right. that, that he do. Right. 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 Yeah. With Ali and Leonard, it was both more about reflexes and, and head movement yeah. legs, right? Right, yeah. It was, they was being young and reflexing, just, yeah. you know, just fighting off of uh, just ad living. you know what I'm saying? Just taking, you know, taking what they could get. Yeah. There's another thing that we often um, differ on. When, when anybody mentions Sugar Ray Robinson, and I totally agree with you that most people are just regurgitating what they heard. Because he may have right. Us, right? He may have been, but most people don't know that. They're just repeating it because it's been said. Right. And I agree with you. But the thing I don't agree, when you always say, man, he had 19 losses. And I always say, yeah, but he only had one loss in his first 131. That's got to count for something. You seem to think the 19 losses is some kind of knock against Ray Robinson's ultimate greatness when... Uh, but, but you got to take their whole... How come, you know, we can't break down... We can't take break down fighters' uh, records and say, well, okay, well, these fights don't count because it is. Sure. These gonna fight don't count because of this. I mean, it, it's his... I mean, first of all, we'll never know who the best pound for pound fighter is. No. And, 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 and my, in my head... The best pound for pound fight in the world is going to be a heavyweight. Yeah. Because can't nobody else beat no heavyweight. But that's why they invented the term pound for pound, Monto. To say yeah, oh. but, yeah, I understand that. I understand that. But, you know, it, it, like I said, we we had never agree. I mean, just like, uh, you know, uh, Ray Leonard, I mean, Roberto Duran fans want to say, well, if he, if he was motivated on his shape, yeah, yeah. come on, you, you ain't supposed to. I mean, everything. Everything, you know what I'm saying, is official. But, I mean, I'm not knocking nobody. I mean, it, it's, it, it's too hard to pick who is the greatest pound for pound yeah. fighter is in the world. But, I mean, you know, bro, I just, a lot of times I just be talking, I be saying silly stuff. Yeah, but you do believe the 90s was the greatest boxing decade. Yeah, and, and I'm not saying it because I fought in the 90s. But if you look from 105 to heavyweight, from when Chiquita Gonzalez and uh, Carbajal up to... Riddick Bowl, Lennox Lewis. Uh, come on. I mean, it was the greatest era. I mean, even Pernod Whitaker, Chavez, they all became stars in the 90s. But there's an 80s pound for pound list from 1981, and it's got Aguayo, Sanchez, Leonard, Hagler, Pryor, Spinks, um, Gomez. Uh, it, it, it's a hell of a list, do you know what I'm saying? It, it, it almost looks like the best pound for pound top 10 in any era, with some of those guys, Hagler, with, uh, so some of those guys actually having the, the claim maybe to be the greatest in their division, maybe. Although I know you say, you say if Hagler can't beat Little Ray Leonard, he ain't beating Big Carlos Monson. Bro, James Tony, uh, Marvin Hagler was made for James Tony. Yeah. James Tony would box. James Tony would box circles around Marvin Hagler, and I'm not take. First of all, because people, a lot of people say. You always get James Tony credit because you beat him. Yeah. No, James Tony was my favorite fighter, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I looked at him as an idol. Yeah, I just I just feel that, and I don't know I don't know what happened between Hagler and B Hop, but James Tony is prime, Hagler is prime. <clears throat> He'll pick him apart. Hagler not that good of a boxer to 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 deal with James Tony. Uh, uh his uh, his slickness. Yeah, yeah Hagler was tough and great. But I don't think he was uh, good enough for boxing to get James Tony any problems. I thought Marvin was a consummate boxer at times. I mean, when he like dismantled Tony Simpson and Wayne Rowland, those kind of eras, Marvin could move. Like, right. Benny Briscoe, you look at the Benny Briscoe fight. Hagler is a dancer when he wants to be. Hagler is balletic when he wants to be. Right. He boxes at. Right. Right. But I'm talking. No, but I'm talking about. I'm talking about another good, yeah. another great. Another good six. That's all I'm saying. Maybe, so. And you know, I mean, who knows? And that's why we evaluate fighters on their entire body of work, like you say their entire career. I mean, the best way I heard it summed up recently as I was talking to Russell Peltz and he says, all I ever say is, I talk about this guy was one of the 100 greatest fighters of all time, but on any given day, 89 might be 12. Number 89 might be number 12. He said, I don't believe in a pound for pound greatest or, or whatever. He said, I just believe there's fighters I could probably isolate being the 100 greatest to ever live, just about. And you could maybe swap a few guys or move a few guys in and out. But he said that he, like you, he said he doesn't believe in the greatest ever because. Yeah, I can't. I mean, if you look at you, you look at uh, the guy who fought with uh, Henry Armstrong, he's world champion three different weight classes at the same time. Yeah. How come he don't get no credit for being the greatest pound for pound? And then there's the other thing, right? This is where it gets interesting because you know what? He doesn't look that great on film. He looked good because how important is that? You know that some people say, well. 
against Ray Robinson looks good, you know, um, in the footage that they've got of him. He looks pretty devastating. He looks a good mover. So, and, and for guys like Roy Jones and Sugar Ray Leonard, looks super good. Floyd Mayweather looks great on film. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the whole thing is getting a W. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It, I know guys look like a million dollars that lose fights. So, you know, the whole thing is you want to get a win. So, I don't really... And another thing, I, I'm I'm not a guy who who only look at slick fighters and say, you know, like, you know, I, I don't care how you fight. As long as you get in there and do the job. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I used to always get Sean Porter credit. People were like, I can't believe you like him. He don't fight nothing like the, the guys that you like. I said, no, he win. All he does is win fights. Yeah. So, you got to respect him for that. Henry Armstrong, uh, like I said, you know, I, I don't take nothing. Ray, Ray Robinson is great. You know what I'm saying? I ain't knocking n nothing about him. If he's a pound for pound or whatever, I don't have no problem with that. And, and they and they, and they they say, well, we saw him as a 160-pounder. They said he was even better than 147. And we don't have no videos of that. So, you know, I ain't, I ain't knocking him. And like I said, on Facebook, man, if you hear me say some, a lot of stuff, I just be yeah. getting under people's skin. Yeah. And, and it'd be working. For sure. Well, Monto, it was great to have this uh, much more civilized conversation. You know, you get a better feel for somebody in real time, you know. So, and, you know, um, it is an honor to, 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 to speak to such a, a fine fighter and a nice guy. So, thanks very much. Well, the pleasure's mine. But I, I met you in Vegas, uh, what, that, uh, yeah. uh, that boxing rival We were at the same party, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I got a picture with you, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do? I'm going to have to look for that picture. I don't know where it is because I know... I know Spencer Fearon got one. I think, yeah, maybe I got one too. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm. Uh, I look for it and send it to. You. I, I know. I, I know it's a picture of me and you. Okay. I saw. One. Yeah, I need to find that. Okay, champ. Well, listen, that that was great. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut this up and use it for YouTube as well. So put it out so anybody who hasn't seen it, some of your many fans can have a look if they didn't see it now. Okay. I would. Let me just tell everybody. Look, uh, Montel Ice Griffin. I, I'm not the greatest fighter in the world. I don't have the best life in the world, but. I have a book out about my life, which which is kind of crazy, cause my life wasn't just a my life wasn't a story about just going to the gym and how to box and then fighting. It was, it was crazy. So if you, if you get a chance, uh, theicelifebook.com, theicelifebook.com, check out uh, the story of my life. I think it's very uh very interesting. For sure, I need to get that too. Okay, I'm gonna get on that. Okay, thank you, Montel. Oh, my man, thank you. Thank you. Much respect, champ. My man.